Welcome to lecture 8 of experimental vibration analysis. In this lecture we discuss measurement systems and sensors used for vibration measurements. The content of this video is found in chapter 11 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. This is the first video of lecture 8 and here we discuss how measurement systems for vibration measurements are designed and we explain the most important technical specifications that you need to understand to use such a system. In the second video we present some common sensors used for vibration measurements. There are many different commercial systems available for noise and vibration measurements. Typical systems today range from small palm-sized units with four channels up to large multi-channel systems with over a, a thousand channels. Usually, the systems are controlled by software on a laptop computer. All systems for noise and vibration measurements consist of the following, following key parts. First, there is an AC-DC switch, which you can usually control from the software. After that, there is a gain adjustment in most instruments. Then follows an analog anti-aliasing filter the analog to digital converter, ADC, and a digital filter. As indicated in the dotted box in the figure here, these three units are often part of a single unit, the Sigma Delta ADC. More about that later. The digitized signal is then processed by, for example, FFT for spectrum analysis, and then displayed usually on the laptop. Most inst uh, instruments today can also record the time signal directly to the hard disk or a solid state disk, uh, which is certainly what I recommend you to do, because then you can analyze your signal again and again with different settings. The AC-DC coupling is very important. For most vibration measurements, you should have the instrument AC coupled. This forces the signal through a capacitor, which removes any DC component from the signal. This is necessary if you're using IEPE sensors, as the DC bias voltage of those sensors needs to be removed before the analog to digital conversion. There are two instances where the DC coupling may be preferable, however. Either when you're measuring transients, for example pulses, that are not symmetric around zero volts. Or when you are measuring very low frequencies, perhaps below five hertz or so, and you want accurate amplitude measurements. In the analog to digital, digital conversion stage, the analog signal is converted to a digital signal, that is a discrete signal, represented by binary numbers as indicated here. The analog to digital conversion consists of two things. First, the analog signal is converted to a discrete signal at certain instances in time. Secondly, at each sampling instant, the signal is discretized in amplitude. This latter point is of course common with all measurements. Once you have measured a value, it comes with a certain uncertainty, or resolution, or, if you like, with a certain number of, uh, of significant figures. The former point, the time discretization, we already discussed in conjunction with the sampling theorem, so we will not repeat that here. The amplitude discretization in principle works like this. Every ADC has a certain resolution given by the number of bits or the number of binary numbers in the conversion. In this figure, the number of bits is 3. This is certainly an insufficient number, but used here for simplicity. The 3 bits gives 7 possible numbers, as indicated on the y-axis on the left. The entire amplitude range is then divided into seven intervals, as also indicated. If we assume that the ADC can measure an analog signal within plus minus 10 volts, the range of the ADC, 
then the intervals become those indicated on the right hand side. So each interval in this simplified example is approximately 3 volts. Now for each sample the ADC determines in which interval the analog signal is and attributes the binary number for that interval to the discrete signal. This means that the higher the number of bits, the more intervals and thus the higher the resolution of the discretized signal will be. The principle of the ADC in the last slide brings us to the important concept of dynamic range. The, dy the dynamic range of a signal is the ratio of the largest and the smallest details that can be observed simultaneously, and usually it's given in dB. The largest value is of course the range of the measurement, whereas the smallest detail will be determined by the number of bits of the ADC. The actual dynamic range can be modeled in detail by something called quantization noise, which we will not do here. And this is because with today's instruments, for any practical purpose, it's enough to consider that each bit in the ADC allows for a doubling of the number of quantization levels. Since a doubling in amplitude corresponds to 6 dB, this means that the dynamic range due to quantization is approximately the number of bits multiplied by 6 dB. You should note, however, that this dynamic range is due to the quantization. As we will show later, the actual dynamic range of a measurement system will be determined by other factors, such as noise floor in the electronics, and not the least, the crosstalk between channels. But we will get back to that. As you can see here, typical instruments today with 24-bit ATCs have approximately a 144 dB dynamic range. This is a very high number. The most common sensors for vibration analysis that we will see in the next video, for example, have a dynamic range of approximately 100 dB. To get as high dynamic range as possible, it's necessary to make sure that the measured signal uses most of the range of the ADC. With the high resolution in the ADCs in today's instruments, however, this is less important than it was before. It's in practice more important to select the correct sensor, particularly if IEPE sensors that we will present in the next video are used. You're, you have to keep in mind that overload that happens if the signal, if the analog signal, if only for a brief moment, moment increases above the input range. Such overloads are disastrous to the measurement system. So you always have to keep a margin so that overloads do not occur. Here's a picture that shows the effect of reduced dynamic range. On the left hand side, a spectrum of a signal filling the range of the ADC is shown. As you can see, the noise floor here, due to the quantization, is well below 10 to minus 5. On the right hand side, you see the result of increasing the range of the measurement system by a factor 10 while keeping the signal, the actual signal, uh, constant. As you can see, the noise floor is now higher since the noise floor is related to the full scale range of the ADC. The risk with this is, of course, that there may be a spectrum components in the signal that you miss because they are obscured by the noise floor. Another thing that leads to a reduction in dynamic range in spectrum measurements is if the sampling instances are not occurring at very equal distances in time. That is, if there is a time jitter in the sampling instances. In the plot here, a simulation result with two spectra is shown. One spectrum is using the entire accuracy of Mat MATLAB, resulting in approximately a 250 dB dynamic range. And the second 
spectrum is from a case where there has been added an inaccuracy on the sampling instances of 10 to minus 4. As you can see, both spectra show the correct peak value at 300 Hz, but the spectrum using the signal with a jitter has a much reduced dynamic range. A consequence of this is that if you want to design your own measurement system, you need to make sure that you incorporate so-called sample and hold circuits that ensure accurate and stable sampling instances. We will now look at the analog to digital conversion again. As we discussed, there needs to be an analog anti-aliasing filter prior to the ADC to ensure no aliasing is occurring. Here's an illustration that shows how the anti-alias filter is designed. As we learned in chapter 3, a real-life low-pass filter has a limited slope between the passband and the stopband. Therefore, as indicated here, the anti-aliasing filter needs to be set to a cutoff frequency well below the Nyquist frequency. This cutoff frequency, F sub C, is also limiting the useful frequency range. Above this frequency, the signal may be contaminated by aliasing components. The cutoff frequency is chosen such that a frequency which is folded into the measurement frequency range is attenuated at least as much as the wanted dynamic range. Traditionally, the cutoff frequency F sub C in noise and vibration systems have been, has been set to the sampling frequency divided by 2.56. This is, however, not always the case in modern systems. You may find systems today which use a slightly lower factor than the factor 2.56. Most dedicated systems for noise and vibration analysis today use a type of ADC called sigma delta. Here is how that works. This technique utilizes a one-bit analog to digital conversion, which could seem like a bad idea, but it's actually giving almost ideal results. The trick is that the ADC works at a very high frequency, typically above 6 MHz. Then, digital decimation filters are downsampling the signal to the requested bandwidth and sampling frequency. This means that the analog anti-aliasing filter, as indicated here, can be a very low order filter, as it typically has a cutoff frequency in most instruments around 20 kHz, and then it needs to have fallen to, say, 110 dB dynamic range, only at the Nyquist frequency of 3 MHz or more. Then, after the ADC, there is a digital low-pass filter, which does two things. First, it low-pass filters the data to a cutoff frequency depending on the sample rate wanted. Secondly, it decimates the data to the lower sampling rate output. Now, in the example shown here, the difference in the sampling rate before and after that decimating low-pass filter is approximately 20,000 times. Think of this in terms of statistics. Every output sample is based on a weighted average of 20,000 input values. Surely, this makes the average value on the output much more accurate than each of the values on the input were. This is the great idea behind Sigma Delta ADCs, and in practice this results in very high performance. There is, however, one warning I want to issue. The digital filter on the right-hand side should be a linear phase filter. For the ADC to perform well for transient signals, for example from pyroshock measurements. Such filters are, however, expensive. So, not all Sigma Delta-based measurement systems actually have linear phase filters. This is something you have to look for in the datasheet if you need to measure transients. 
A confusing situation can happen with modern measurement systems as indicated here. It can typically happen when the signal you analyze contains frequencies higher than those you are interested in, but lower than the maximum frequency range of the instrument. Let's assume that you want to analyze the 50 Hz signal shown in the plot here, but there is a much higher 200 Hz signal. Now, you set the measurement range so that the cutoff frequency of the digital Lopez filter is 100 Hz. Then, to your surprise, the instrument detects an overload situation despite the fact that the signal on your screen looks perfectly okay, as you see here. The reason for this is, of course, that the 200 Hz component is overloading your instruments. But after the digital filters, you cannot see this component on your display. What you should do if you encounter this situation of an inexplicable overload is to set the measurement frequency range up to the maximum range to see the entire signal which is seen by the ADC. There's no good solution to this situation except finding an external analog Lopez filter and put it in front of your measurement system. Finally, we will describe some of the most important specifications for a good noise and vibration measurement system. We will start with the dynamic range. Many vibration analysis tasks require very high dynamic range. This is usually achieved today where almost all systems have 24-bit ADCs. You should be aware, however, that although 24-bit ADC theoretically give you 144 dB dynamic range, the actual dynamic range in most systems is considerably lower. Typically, you find ranges from maybe 100 to 130 dB. In most cases, there is little need for optimizing the input range in many cases. Particularly if you use IEPE sensors, then you can use a fixed range of 5 volts, the maximum range of the IEPE standard. A much neglected specification is the cross-channel talk, or simply cross-talk, or sometimes channel separation. The cross-talk is measured by coupling a sign generator signal to one channel and shorting all the other signals. Then you measure the signal level on the shorted channels where some of the sign signal is visible due to imper imperfections in the isolation between the channels. Typically, the crosstalk is specified in dB. And if you look at a typical measurement system, you will often find that the crosstalk is rarely more than 80 to 90 dB. This is thus the limiting factor for your dynamic range in most situations. Finally, some words about the sampling process. We need precise sampling both in terms of simultaneous sampling instances and with constant time differences between the samples, as we said before. The first is necessary for cross-channel phase accuracy, and the second to get spectra with high dynamic range. All dedicated noise and vibration systems are good at this. If you design your own system, however, you have to make sure to include so-called sample and hold circuits. And this concludes the present video. You should now proceed to video 8b.